Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Jeremy Epstein. I'm the chair of ACM's US Technology Policy Committee, and it's my honor to give the opening, uh, which is mostly the administrative uh, stuff associated with today's hot topics. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, today's event is being recorded and we'll make it available online. And we'll also be using it to promote uh, ACM USTP and USTPC activities. Uh, if you're a journalist, this is on background. Um, you can read the, the, the rules there. Um, I believe we have live captioning active um, and uh, microphones of all the attendees will be muted. You can chat with the panelists, uh, but you can't chat with each other. This is just to uh, control uh, things going crazy. Uh, if you wanna um, send a question, use the Q&A button. Please don't use the chat question, the chat button to ask a question. Use the Q&A uh, button when we get to that point. Um, and uh, our moderator, uh, Jim Hendler, will uh, be asking the questions. And if you uh, need assistance, uh, send a chat message uh, to the host. Um, it says ACM policy, but I think it'll just show up as, as host. Um, next, please. So let me tell you just a tiny bit about uh, ACM Europe and uh, US uh, technology uh, policy committees. These are two committees that we have uh, going for, well, USTPC is now celebrating its 30th anniversary in Europe, uh, I think about 10 years. Um, there's a lot more information about them on these websites. It's uh, very easy to join, uh, send an email to us, and uh, you, don't, you don't look on the website uh, for how to do it, or just send us an email and we'll be happy to have you join. And uh, we do events like this, as well as putting out uh, policy and position uh, papers in both uh, the United States uh, and in Europe. So we'd love to have you involved in our uh, happy party. Um, and uh, we always pick up a few folks from these events. Uh, please uh, consider joining us. We, uh, our mission is, as you can see, to inform the computing community about advances uh, to provide independent, nonpartisan, and technology neutral research and resources um, that, uh, and make this available to government decision makers and other policy makers and uh, provide the best science advice available. You can see here some of the uh, lists of uh, things that we've been working on recently. Um, and uh, uh, all of these are available on our webpage. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, so today's um, panel will be looking specifically at the a new statement, which is really an update of a previous statement called the Statement on Principles for Responsible Algorithmic Systems. Um, part of what's new here, but won't be the primary focus of today's discussion, is that the ACM has created a Technology Policy Council to oversee and advise uh, a more global approach to uh, the issues that are of concern to uh, computer scientists and computer practitioners and really reach out to the full membership. And so um, this document was actually one of the first ones to be endorsed by all, not, by not both, not just the uh, US and European committees, but uh, the overall Technology Policy Council. Next slide. And so this is who we have with us today. I'm, I'm Jim Hendler, and my primary role here today is moderator. I'm the chair of the ACM's Technology Policy Council, and you can read more about me if you care. Um, <clears throat> Ricardo uh, Bezieres, he's a member of the US uh, Technology po Policy Council and an ACM fellow. He is Director of Research at the Institute for Exper Experiential AI of Northeastern University and a member of the Data Lab at the NU Corey College of Computer Sciences. 
Uh, Lorena uh, Palasi, sorry, Lorena, I should have asked you how to pronounce your name before the meeting, uh, is founder of the Ethical Tech Society in Berlin. She's been a member of the International Advisory Board on the European Parliament's Panel for the Future of Science and Technology, and has previously been the Executive Director of Algorithm Watch. Uh, I'm going to jump over to Alejandro Sacedo, who is a um, member of the ACM Council and the Europe uh, Technology Policy Committee. He's the um, <coughs> excuse me, Engineering Director for Machine Learning at Selden Technologies, has been a Chief Scientist at the Institute for Ethical AI, and a number of other things which you can see here. And last, I'm going to introduce Gina, uh, because I'm going to ask her the first question, <laughs> and so we can go right into it. Gina is both a member of the U.S. Policy Council, but also the Global Technology Council. Um, she's co-chair of our uh, of the Committee on AI and Algorithmic Accountability, professor of computer science at Clarkson. Um, Again, many other things, but I think um, probably the most important thing today with respect to the topic is that Gina was, uh, along with Ricardo, um, a lead author, and I would say the driving force behind updating an earlier statement to the new statement. So um, with that, I... Uh, Yes, good. So what I'm going to do in uh, panel style is just go around, ask each panelist a, a question, and then it will. I have a few questions up my sleeves that they haven't seen before, but we also would love to get your questions. Um, <clears throat> but to start, Gina, let me ask you to summarize both the statement, uh, you know, what was in the 2017 statement, how it's been used, and more imp important, what stayed the same and what has changed. Thank you, uh, Jim, for that uh, warm introduction. Welcome, everyone. Um, as Jim said, in late October, the three uh, technology policy groups at ACM co-released a new statement and I put a link in the chat. I'm not sure if everyone can see that there. It's pretty uh, deliberately short, six pages, so it, it won't take long to skim it. Nine principles, well, really 14, if you count the five principles that kind of cheat and contain an and, like the first one, legitimacy and competency, or security and privacy, you get the idea. So nine principles, 14 if you squint. Um, and it really is an update of a statement from 2017. Um, it was that 2017 statement was two pages, seven principles, many of the principles the same, explainability, auditability, accountability. There's really no deletions. There was expansions and, and reframing in some cases. Um, the 2017 statement was one of the earliest statements of this kind. Since then, there have been a lot of different statements issued by different groups. But also since 2017, we've really seen a huge amount of value from using this statement, sending it to uh, lawmakers around the world, um, using it as um, a, a way to represent the ACM Code of Ethics as applied to this topic in particular. Um, and I'd also like to highlight that in the new document, there is a section on application of principles, uh, governance and trade-offs, not just straight, only the principles. And I think that's another wonderful change we've seen since 2017 around the world is moving beyond statements of principles to frameworks and legislation. Um, but we were really excited to update this statement. We've seen uh, the, the 2017 statement do a lot of uh, good in this space. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Gina. And um, excuse me, Ricardo. I'm gonna, as the second co-author, let me ask you. You know, what are what are some of the key things that you see have changed in um, this statement? And you've also, I know, worked a lot with developers 
in terms of um, some of these things. So could you say a little bit about the changes and about the impact on development? Yes, yeah, thank you, Jim, uh, and welcome everybody. I, I would say that the 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 main the main change uh, there are like four principles that are kind of new on the, on the nine that we have, but the the main the main one for me is uh, the the first one, which I, I believe it would should be the number zero, not number one, because you have to do it before everything else. Is the one of legitimacy and competence. So basically, that means that you uh, did all the legal compliance. You did the ethical uh, an ethical impact assessment to to basically know the trade off between benefits and harm. Uh, that is even more clear in the second principle, where we again explicitly say to minimize harm. But then the competence means uh, that you have the administrative competence. So basically, you have the permission to do it. In many cases that we have seen, uh, that was not the case. Uh, you also have, of course, the technical computer science competence. And even more important, you have the domain competence of the field that you will uh, have the application operation. And part of the legitimacy is also social. So basically, you have the social acceptance for such a tool, because sometimes the perception of people is also very uh, relevant. Now, in, in the case of minimizing harm, uh, we added another one, one uh, explicitly, is that limiting the environmental impact of our applications. We have already seen with the blockchain, with uh, ML training, and, and also uh, inference. For example, we have focused a lot on the, how much uh, resources are, are spent on training uh, large models. But for example, the inference uh, in billions of people is much worse. And we haven't really thought about the impact of that. And it's not only about, uh, about uh, for example, uh, carbon impact, but also about water and other things that are important for all the people. And regarding developers, uh, uh, Gina mentioned this, this, this uh, governance and trade-offs that we included, because I think all people understand the principles, but many people don't understand how to, to put them in practice. So there we include things like, like for example, that solutions should be proportional to the problem being solved. Uh, basically, uh, sometimes you are using a big, large model for something that's very simple, also, uh, how, how you need to, to run the system, because many times people use the best accuracy, but for example, depending on the, on the, on the application, uh, false positives or false negatives have different values, for example, from health to, to, to other uh, fields of work. Uh, also, uh, transparency is important, but it's not enough if we don't have ways to, to do audits and be accountable. So transparency alone is not helpful. And, and finally, uh, also be careful about explainability uh, because in some cases it may be also an issue. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, Alejandro, one of the things that was added to this was a discussion about uh, security and privacy principles, and of course, other issues related to those. Would you... Um, Care to comment a little more on those? I know that's something you're quite interested in. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you, Jim. And uh, yeah, so I think I think security is uh, and privacy are very interesting topics. Uh, not only because as practitioners we've already acknowledged the importance in the general software, right? The paramount importance of um, addressing potential vulnerabilities in our um, systems is something that now we expect as a baseline uh, in any production environment. Now, this is no different with, um, you know, algorithmic responsibility. Um, ultimately, uh, the cost of, um, you know, cyber uh, related attacks, uh, it has been quantified to about uh, over 5 uh, trillion uh, uh, globally, and it's expected to be uh, over 10 trillion by 2025. So we are dealing with a big challenge that affects um, society as a whole um, and individuals. When it comes to um, this applied into uh, algorithmic systems, we have to take into account that there are new paradigms that have to be considered. And there are some really interesting efforts that are currently uh, being carried out to identify 
uh, as practitioners, what can we do to ensure security in these intelligent systems? Now, one thing to, to, to realize is that, like Ricardo uh, highlighted, um, some of these principles are overlapping, particularly security actually uh, overlaps with many other principles. So the simple question of um, introducing explainability uh, opens other considerations, such as who should have access to that explainability and interpretability? Should that explainability be restricted to relevant domain experts? Should that be publicly accessible or should that be only um, uh, accessible to a subset? And then similarly, there are uh, important areas that uh, are also relevant uh, related to the contestability and auditability, right? If you don't actually have the tracing, if you don't actually have the audits, you wouldn't be able to actually have a look at what potentially happened. And that is important, not just on audits in themselves, but when it comes to systems related to, uh, you know, not just algorithmic systems, but machine learning, uh, reproducibility becomes also uh, a consideration. It's not just what happened, but can we reproduce it? So those are a few uh, things that would revolve around security and privacy. Um, and yeah, it is a very important area that will certainly receive a lot of attention in the near and medium term. Thank you. And Lorena, um, I'm going to ask you one, which probably will come as no surprise since you're the founder of the Ethical Tech Society and have played a number of roles in the issues of ethics and legitimacy connected with algorithms. But can you tell us a little bit more about how you see ethics and legitimacy playing into the future of technology and the uh, particular issues of uh, these kind of algorithms? Well, thank you for the question and for inviting me. Um, I think that what, what we see um, more and more, for instance, right now with the European Union created this AI Act, that is basically a set of principles where ethics and law also sort of intersect. It's not only about creating more regulation, but it also entails specific um, self-evaluation tools and so on. So um, what we see is that this is playing more and more um, a role both at the political level, but also at a societal level. We see that people expect engineers to think about the social dimension of the tools that they create and about their impact. So um, so I, th I do think that, um, that this is an issue that um, it's going to be part of um, all the all the uh, usual characteristics that you would expect from a tool, right? Um, and on the other side, um, I think that to a certain extent, what it's important to remember is that when we when we create a specific uh, system, the system already has its own ethics. Um, and uh, this system is not, so to say, um, free of, um, of, of, of a moral compass. And the most important thing um, sometimes is, um, is, is to understand that depending on the geography where you're using that system, legitimacy might look very different. So just to put an example, uh, if, you, um, if you are working in, um, in countries where there is no trust in the government, a lot of systems might be legal, but uh, from an ethical standpoint, they might be not legitimate. And um, it's a trade-off as a company if you are using that system and are, uh, so to say, an actor in between, um, that you need to assess um, with a different set of criteria um, than if you would be in a country where you know that there is a high trust on the government and that there is rather less trust on the private sector. So um, um, I think that um, what uh, is important to remember is that most of these principles are very abstract. And in the everyday life, um, we will see that things change and that uh, it's important to... Um, to, to sort of remember that whatever principles um, are developed within the engineering community, um, they are um, 
subject on the first place to a much broader context there that it is important to um it, to a certain extent to breach this hierarchy of knowledge that we have because this is a very big trend for the last 400 years what we've seen is what we call the hierarchization of knowledge um, where engineer sciences have more and more um, use the way how they do science to influence other types of disciplines. So we see that there are boot camps for um, coding for social scientists, but where are the boot camps for engineers on social sciences? And that has a lot to do with the hierarchization of knowledge. But um, there's an important, the reason why our sciences are different is because they complement each other and because different methodologies matter to have a more systemic view on things, precisely in the field of ethics. So I think it's important to um, make sure as engineers that um, to keep connected to the other sciences and to reach out to make sure that um, that 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 you are aware of this historical hierarchization of knowledge to the impact that you have and that you really need to um, perhaps um, open yourself to other methodologies that go beyond what you've been trained for because they will be um, decisive for the legitimacy of a system. So I would just like to remind uh, those of you out there, the attendees, that we have a Q&A system here, one or two of uh, you have already started asking questions, but I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative of asking the first question. I'm going to ask it really to, to Gina, but then open it to the rest of the panel if they'd like to come in. Uh, Gina, where do you see this going next? Uh, what other kinds of things do we need statements like this on? Uh, what are some of the opportunities you see for the use of this statement, et cetera? Thanks, Jim, for that question. Um, I think first up is really using this statement to open up conversations with policymakers, government entities, regulators, standards bodies. We've already seen that happen with the 2017 statement. And it's, it's a very powerful opportunity for a large professional society like ACM to translate you know, professional ethics in our field. And, and not just at a high level like the code of ethics, but very specifically to the field of AI. And um, it allows engineers and computer scientists working in companies to point to a statement that kind of backs up why they want to enact, you know, ethical policies in practice in their groups. And, um, you know, one of the ways we've really seen this, these statements used is it takes a lot of time to develop consensus policies like this, but then they have a lot, a lot of, a lot of power. If there, you get a lot of uh, requests for comments from governments and they want them quickly, and having these statements constructed and and really spend the time on, uh, to establish the consensus allows us to react quickly uh, to those requests and have real impact on things like the AI Act in the EU or voluntary frameworks in the US like the NIST AI Risk Management Framework. You also asked about other statements uh, that we're working on. Um, we are working on a new statement about generative AI, which is very hot topic and very important to consider the, the policy and, and ethical uh, questions there. And um, we also very recently been talking about statements related to maybe um, machine learning and security, in particular, that mix of things. So if folks listening would like to use these statements uh, to advocate or to get involved, there's lots of opportunities to do so. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on? Yeah, Alejandro, you, you guys don't have to raise your hands, just unmute. And uh -huh. Thank you, Jim. Um, yeah, so I, I just want to uh, echo uh, Jane's uh, words. I think it's absolutely critical, particularly given that these principles are really uh, carrying a big uh, you know, weight coming from the ACM, being adopted by both academics and practitioners of the field of uh, you know, computing. Um, 
because we need to realize that um, it's not enough just to have this, 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 you know, principles, because we have seen a lot of organizations just publishing principles uh, with some of these resources that are coming from an organization like the ACM, uh, practitioners are able to really adopt and implement them by design, right? Because it doesn't matter how many, um, you know, discussions we may have and agree on this, if the tooling is not built with these principles by design, security by design, maintainability by design, you know, the actual higher level requirements are not going to be fulfilled. So it is absolutely key that the underlying infrastructure of not just our systems, but the infrastructure that our society is growingly operating on, these algorithmic systems are built with these principles by design. So I think it's not only great, uh, but it's also um, an initiative of like paramount importance. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, we had a question that came in about um, teaching this, and I'm actually um, laughing a little bit because I have two two classes I teach that are being required to watch the panel today, hi students. But I'm gonna let the panelists answer the question, which is really, you know, um, do we have rec recommendations on how to include the teaching of these principles, particularly in uh, in this case, the question was asked, computer science, bachelor's and graduate programs. Um, maybe I can I can say something very short about that one. Uh, maybe Lorena has a much better idea of how to do uh, to teach ethics to engineers. But I would say we need to teach them right away. So first year, uh, typically you see this uh, done at the end. I think that then it's too late. I think that this has to be at the beginning and, and if possible embedded in every um, course uh, in, in, in the next few years, for example, having remembering each principle when you do, for example, machine learning, when you do security and privacy, when you do uh, other uh, topics, and having examples where we show uh, this in action. Because uh, as uh, Gina and Alejandro said, I, there is no lack of principles. For example, another one would be the, the UNESCO ones that, that uh, also are important. And, and the problem is adoption, how we adopt them. And then the next, after we adopt them, the next, uh, the next challenge will be how to enforce them. Uh, we still have problems enforcing human rights. So I, I think we need to, to do a lot of work on that, but uh, that's the challenge. So how we adopt them massively, and then how we make, to make, make sure that they stay there. Good. Uh, I just, I'd, I'd also just love to say that I think these technology policy groups and also the curriculum work at ACM are both examples of the way ACM works really hard for the field of computing and really represents us as computer scientists well. Um, I think we can do more to integrate these things into the specific curricular recommendations, but I put a link to all of the wonderful curricular recommendations that ACM has. And you know this kind of work of advocating with with government entities or working on curriculum, these are things that all of us as computer scientists, I think, value. And it makes me feel good to know ACM is working hard in these areas. So, um, excuse me. Um, so one of the uh, questions that's come up and also was on my list of surprise questions if no other questions came along um i'm gonna i'm gonna change the order a little bit but it's it's you know are there some case studies or particular examples of both good and bad practices that anyone would like to bring up uh preferably without specifically naming companies but practices and then Following that is, you know, what are the frameworks and tools that may be helpful, either already existent or uh, being designed that will help working computer scientists um, to deal with these issues or to, to have an easier time uh, making, making them happen in the real world? I throw that open to anyone. Mm -hmm. Of you. Yeah, I can, I can, I can. Yeah, maybe give an initial few thoughts, and then, then be great to hear um, any others. Um, but 
I think examples of, uh, yeah, I guess, um, undesired or unexpected outcomes, uh, there's plenty, right? There are actually interesting resources online. Uh, you know, for example, there's uh, uh, GitHub repositories uh, like the Awful AI uh, one, which actually lists uh, a broad range of, of uh, high profile examples where, um, you know, uh, algorithmic systems have gone wrong. So I want to actually comment from a more generic perspective. And the generic perspective is that um, when it comes to um, perhaps an, in, uh, an individual um, that is developing a system, uh, whilst an individual uh, themselves may be, may be ethical, may be following best practices, uh, uh, it may not mean that the whole compound will have an ethical outcome and an ethical uh, result, right? And this is why it's absolutely important to take into consideration and acknowledge that um, uh, large ethical um, uh, challenges cannot fall on the shoulders of a single practitioner, right? Because the use cases where these systems are being rolled out are affecting uh, individuals uh, in ways that could be even generational. So this is one of the points that actually Ricardo mentioned uh, about the importance of assessing uh, the impact that is proportionate to the to the to the risk involved. And when it comes to um, the use and adoption of uh, best practices, it's also important to remember that even though some solutions uh, may be technical in nature, the impact is ultimately human, right? And at the end, the best practices are not just tools, but they are a combination of human touch points uh, with the relevant domain experts at, at, at the relevant stages. And the challenge that comes with um, algorithmic systems is that it's not possible, and this is something that we have seen with large organizations, it's not possible to just adopt the SDLC frameworks that are rolled out uh, enterprise-wide, like your software development lifecycle frameworks, because algorithmic systems are extremely tight and coupled with the the um, uh, use cases themselves and the and the and the potential compliance risk that is involved, right? Ultimately, the impact can be very specific to the models being used, and that means that the overarching processes have to be significantly higher. So that's why it's it's not possible to just give a silver bullet and say, hey, here's the list of tools that you can just leverage. But it's about making sure that it's proportionate and that it's relevant to the to the context. And uh, yeah, we can share some some links of resources that have great tools. But of course, the primary one to use that is at your disposal today is this joint statement uh, on the ACM algorithmic principles, which is a great you know place to start with. Uh, so some initial thoughts. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, there's a lot of questions coming in. Again, the reminder that it's easier for us if, if they come in on the um, Q&A panel. Um, I'm sort of looking at them and trying to, you know, to go through all of them will take us forever. So I'm going to be bunching some of them together. Um, before we move on from from this topic, I'd love to just point to two resources. I'm not sure people are seeing links put in the chat, but there are two conferences, um, AC, the ACM Conference on Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency, ACM FACT, and the AAAI ACM Conference on AI Ethics and Society that have a lot of great work of case studies and tools and, and, and that, that I'd love people to be to know about. So um, I'm going to combine a couple of questions. Um, you know, some of the background of this is I actually am teaching a course called Data and Society, and uh, I inherited it from Fran Berman. Um, she spent a lot of time in, in the course talking about some of the ethical issues, and in particular, sort of the international aspects of that which is that, you know, sort of ethics aren't necessarily universal, uh, things like that. So, so one question becomes, you know, how do we contextualize this? Uh, then there's a, a sort of more 
um, adversarial way the question could be asked, which is there's been strong criticism that AI ethics is useless um, coming from the philosophy of technology community with the argument that the ethical principles are too high level abstract, don't provide a lot of guidance. Um, and then, of course, the whole field of computer science is often accused of operating in an unethical fashion. So, Lorraine, I'm going to throw these nice, easy ethical questions over to you first and then let other people answer. Thank you for the for mixing them for me. Um, yes, um, from a decolonial perspective, so from a perspective uh, that is very critical about the power asymmetries that we have in the world and how um, our history and the history of thought and the history of um, our economy and social societies and so on have influenced the way how the world works nowadays. Um, what we can see is that, yes, there is no international ethics, but we do have an international ethics discourse that is rather an expression of uh, new colonial neo-colonial thought or what Aníbal Quijano once would call coloniality, which means um, European thought has been always very much focused on trying to find abstract principles um, that are rational, assuming that rational means objective, uh, freed from bias, and um, that um, can be generalized for everyone because when 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 that Cartesian so the card thought that if you create a rationality that is purely objective then your context does not matter your social position does not matter your um, identity does not doesn't matter the color of your skin of your skin doesn't matter and what he was actually telling us with that um, with that idea of rationality that has marked so hard the way how we do science, not only in engineering sciences, but also in social sciences as well, and also even in, in, in law. Um, what this means is actually that, um, that he's describing something that it's impossible. Of course, our social position matters. Of course, the language we've been grown up with and, and build up with um, marks and, and, and forms the way how we see the world. And there's no way how we can detach all those different parts of ourselves that, that puts us in the world and makes our view always subjective. And this is also part of the problem. And, and when we talk about, um, international ethics what we're also what what we're actually saying is a reformulation of that old idea of being able to find something that is objective for everyone independent of their position so that's a very colonial idea because that initial idea was the idea with which then um the white europeans came to the US, uh, not the US, the America, the, and Abiy Ayala, and to Africa, and to Asia, and um, exploited people and legitimated that exploitation and enslavement. So indeed, there's no international, no such thing as international ethics um, in, in with regards uh, to the idea that there is an ethic that applies um, to all because it's rational for all. But of course, we can come to international agreements on ethics. And this is what we try to do uh, through international organizations. But I must say also there, um, the point is always this, or the focus is always trying to find abstract principles for all. And I think that this is really important to stress as, when, um, as has been said before, we need to contextualize for every different situation, for every different geography. What applies to a um, to, his, to a indigenous person in a very specific geography in um, New Zealand is not the same as uh, what applies to an Italian European woman, um, and it's again not the same to what would apply to a San Francisco young um, entrepreneur. It's just simply different 
um, assumptions about the world, different conditions, and also different chances on the world. Um, so um, what was the other part of the question? Uh, apart from not, not international ethics, uh, what we need to, what was the other part? I'm trying to find the... Um, well, it was my fault because I um, mix these uh, things, but um, it, so yes, there's a case. I think you've already addressed it. it. Was that sort of one was the kind of uselessness because of lack of generality, and the other one is isn't it you know really locally contextualized? So you really have been able yes. to those. But but I think I, yeah, I think and the last the last the last part that I would like to add is indeed the principles that we've been dealing with for the last 10 years were Western principles that are colonial principles that are again window dressing. And I think that this was what was being addressed by different disciplines, trying to explain that many of those principles are, um, are not really um, about understanding the core problems, but providing um, morality ethics so um, are more about legitimation. So this is one of the, for instance, criticism about the European Union with their um, trustworthy AI, uh, where it is not um, a, 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 as regulation and a promotion of AI that um, is focused on a narrative to, and on, le on, on, on legal mechanisms to make AI more, um, more human rights based or the like, but it's more about a narrative on making people trust specific technology independently of what it means trusting that technology. And, and I think that um, this criticism is valid because what we need to uh, reconsider when it comes to many of the technologies that we use is that many of the problems that we have right now are because of European ethics are because of the way how European thinking has been shaping science and has been shaping the way how we think that we need to solve problems. And what we are seeing or what we have the chance right now with this type of situations where um, um, engineers now need to rethink how they are doing things and they have the chance to go a step back and also rethink what is the thinking that is guiding me to 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 create a system um do i need if i want to um to help uh fire workers to combat fire do i need to optimize the fireman or the firewoman with an exoskeleton or do i need to think about fire as a process for instance and not focus so much on optimizing an individual this form of thinking will shape the way how you create systems. And this is a moment for engineers to also rethink um, their assumptions about the world and what they understand under optimization. And this has a lot to do with European culture and its colonialism and its way of exploitating things. And you have the chance right now because there's a lot of other initiatives like indigenous AI, for instance, that is bringing new ways of thinking when programming or um, the Kati Maori um, initiative in New Zealand where they uh, started to create a different language systems with different um, ideas of how to make it um, marketable um, and create systems that are more oriented for community use and less oriented for capitalistic use. So I think that this is a good opportunity to also not only think about the ethics um, of machine learning and um, new technologies, but also to think about the epistemology, the way how we do science and to think also and remember um, that you are creating technologies based on a long history that has been joining you before you started to create those technologies. All the culture and history and things that you've learned in school and around you have shaped the way how you are. And you need to unpack this before you create technology. Um, but I will leave it there. Sorry, I'm talking too long. Thank you. So, um, you know, there have been a number of different questions asking about um, 
essentially the regulation of this, the first one to come in was, you know, with the proliferation of large foundation models in AI and ML. So nowadays people, rather than building their own small model, are taking some large learning model or some uh, open, open system, which has been trained on, you know, billions of pages. Um, some have been open sourced without testing. Some are, you know, as it were, almost beta test by releasing it to the public and saying, hey, what can you do with this? Um, but on the, you know, on one hand, these have led to some very strong uh, advancements, but of course, there are also ill effects in general and that these can bring to specific communities. So the question is sort of about regulation, you know, should we be regulating AI sort of like the way we um, label drugs? Should we be with generative AI? Should we be, you know, looking at some kind of regulation that says, you know, warning this was, uh, you know, this, 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 this panelist statement was generated by uh, GPT-3 or some other AI system, et cetera. So really, let me throw it open. Um, Ricardo, you know, I think I'll, I'm going to let you take first shot at this. Um, because in some ways, these policies are going to most impact industry more than research. And you're sort of been representing that. And Alejandro, if you'd like to, you know, chime in too. Yeah, thank you, Jim. That's a very good question these days. I mean, we have seen uh... Uh, the last one was Galactica, uh, a language, very large language model to write papers. And if already it's very hard to, to write a letter without any semantic issue, imagine to write a, a science article without any semantic issue. And, and of course, even the creators uh, said that the people were abusing of the system when, when the truth is they were trying uh, where the hands of the system. And, and, and this is part of the problem. I think this culture that we have uh, of of doing it fast until it breaks, it's it's not the best when you when when these things works as as like a cluster bomb that can impact everyone. So not only one place on earth, but for example, a billions of people that are uh, recommended things or that uh, basically interact with one of these systems. So so we need to to regulate. I think we need to regulate, and 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 the regulation should be based on the problem. And not on the use of technology. I, I don't like the, the idea of the AI Act because uh, then we will need to regulate quantum computing, uh, blockchain, everything. And this is not a solution. The human rights uh, are rights that are covered for any technology. And the same we need to do for any problem. So I would say that maybe we need to focus on problems. For example, uh, you can generate also fake news with these tools. So basically, all the disinformation problems should be uh, one place for regulating. Uh, I don't believe that cuts innovation. They are the opposite. I think good regulation triggers even better innovation. Another set of this could be the, the use of, uh, of basically um, technologies to, to communicate with people that are not, uh, that the problem will be communicating with people for with any technology in the future that we invent. Uh, and here that will cover, for example, the the correct use of language models. But the, the one issue that we have is that it's not as easy as, for example, some person mentioned, some, some person mentions FDA. I would say that testing a drug is much easier than testing, uh, let's say, a very large language model that is almost a, a real black box. We can't test all possible inputs. Uh, we can't test all possible cases. But the question is uh, how much testing we need to do to say reasonable, uh, well, that works almost all the time, and when it doesn't work, we need to have safety uh, actions that basically will allow the system to stop right away. Uh, but I don't know if that can be done. I think that's a research problem, and this is the problem. We need to we need to keep working, and maybe Lorena disagrees there. Would anyone else like to comment on that? Well, I don't think you can switch it up because usually most of the systems are connected to other systems. And we saw that, for instance, with solar uh, panel um, case that when you switch something off, you don't know what will happen to the rest of the system, right? Um, and from a legal perspective, I don't know if you would have 
problems, you will need to give compensation to the other companies that you cause harm because of you switching the system that is connected to their system. So to my knowledge, this would have uh, certainly a, a legal trade-off or a consequence. So I, I don't think that this is, but this is not included in the AI Act. It's not considered. There's a lot of different contexts in which you can apply AI, but many times we're talking about automated decision-making systems where a decision is being made. And part of the problem is that the risks to deciders are very different than the risks to those being decided about. And when those being decided about have legal rights, ethical rights, human rights that need to be respected, is it going to be possible to do that in a voluntary framework? Um, even market forces, because you have the decider, you have the developers of the systems, their interests are different yet than those who, who use the systems to make decisions. They're different yet than those who are being decided about. So to just say market forces will incentivize what we want here, um, I'm not sure is going to be sufficient. But can we do it through standards and frameworks? Do we need to do it through legislation or regulation? Do we need to do it through independent verification and validation? I think that's what we are, all of all of those knobs could be appropriate in, in certain contexts. And I would definitely like to say that I'm a big fan of different levels of intervention for risks that have different likelihoods and different potential consequences. So the kind of, of intervention you want to do for something that is very likely and has huge consequences or even has huge, you know, like life and liberty kind of consequences, even on a small number of individuals is different than something you would, you would do for a system where the consequences are pretty light or the, you know, um, so we can't lump these things all together in one bucket. So summarizing several questions here, um, People are really asking, you know, we have this set of principles and we, um, as Jeremy mentioned at the beginning, one of the things ACM is very careful about is that we're trying to give non, um, what we call in the U.S. nonpartisan or nonpolitical um, advice that's purely, purely technical to really focus on the policy issues per issues without necessarily making recommendations uh, about what policies to put in place. But a number of the questions that are coming in are really asking sort of less about, you know, the specific policies and more about the fact that, you know, should we be looking, what, what kind of models might we be looking at um, of regulation? So we already talked about something like labeling and things like that. But, you know, other people are asking about, you know, should we have community boards? Um, should we, uh, you know, really be doing um, textual thing, uh, uh, frameworks and uh, tools? You know, what are, I mean, other than the answer, all of the above, is there anything specific people would like to, to mention about particular ways or, or particular recommendations? on a personal level they may have about how policymakers might think more specifically about these things. I think I was the last one to talk on the last topic, but I have I do have something I want to say here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in again and, sure. and say that I think um you can go a lot way a long way from good solid software development life cycle and principles. You know, the principles of documenting throughout all of the life cycles, you know, all the stages of the life cycle of a system involving relevant stakeholders at the different stages. Um, I'm also a really uh, big fan of independent verification and validation. The idea that, you know, getting uh, people who are not involved in the development teams, not even necessarily involved in the managerial or financial aspects to come in and take a look at a system, especially again, when those systems 
have huge consequences. And I will, I'll put a link to um, a document that I had, uh, I, I'm a, I'm a co-author of that I think has some really helpful guidance in. Anyone else on, on that one? That was a pretty open and and wide question. Um, I know in my my computers in society class, we spend a lot of time talking about potential regulation of social media and things like that. This is not that topic, but you know, sort of again, what sort of frameworks might be looked at? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think I think uh, one that was actually particularly interesting. I was in in a panel with, uh, uh, there was a senior executive from a highly regulated sector. So managing basically the um, uh, AI platform for basically a global organization of, of thousands of, of practitioners. Um, this was relevant to the point that I mentioned of um, it not being possible to just copy paste the traditional SDLC frameworks, like the software development lifecycle frameworks that tend to be adopted, like, you know, organization wide. Uh, when it comes to um, algorithmic systems and algorithmic decision making systems, because um, these systems, uh, although they benefit from the same best practices that uh, traditional software development has, unit testing, integration testing, continuous delivery, continuous integration, um, they still are very close to different uh, proportions of risk and different use cases to which you know we have we have mentioned uh, already quite a few times. And then this goes back to to what Jenna was was mentioning that ultimately some use cases may actually require um, different levels of scrutiny, uh, depending on, on what the impact is. And the scrutiny itself may look very different from use case to use case. Now, actually mapping into regulation, one example that I really liked was this uh, regulatory um, uh, you know, uh, framework uh, that was basically um, uh, enacted relatively recently called the Digital Services Act. So this was the one that appeared in, in media that also social media was basically super uh, scared of and, 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 and was sort of like uh, putting, putting kind of like some, some red flags of, of, of some concerns. One of the things that it, I believe did really well is that it actually, me, it actually mentions the concept of the need of explainability, but at no point it actually references uh, any interpretability algorithms. It doesn't uh, demand for machine learning ex explainability of, of a particular model or a particular technique. What it uh, demands is similar to what Ricardo mentioned, which is explainability of the decision that is proportionate to the risk. So end-to-end -end for that particular use case, making sure that the right processes are in place to either be able to explain how a decision was made or conversely, if there are black boxes that are being used, if the risk is proportionately high, then asking the question of whether those black boxes should even be used in those contexts, right? So, so that is a very interesting use case, which actually emphasizes the need to um, you know, consider basically uh, all of the best practices and tooling available and leveraging practitioner best practices with regulatory high level requirements uh, and I do agree. I do. I do agree that it has to be a combination of of all of these different uh, great uh, resources that uh, Jim you you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You know the um, there are a couple questions that have been sent to me directly. Um, one which I really like um, because once upon a time it would have been a science fictiony question, and now it's really becoming a question of reality, which is turning the ethical question almost on its head. We're primarily talking about ethics in the context of when not to use something or, or how to control it. But the question sent to me was, what about cases where, you know, we could send in a robot or an embodied AI of some type to do something which would be dangerous for a human to do? 
And, you know, this this ranges everywhere from disaster relief and things like that. So, you know, um, Robin Murphy is well known for her work in developing robots that can be sent into uh, earthquake remains and things like that to try to save people without putting other people in jeopardy. Um, you know, it's a bit of a slippery slope. San Francisco has recently decided that they would allow uh, human controlled robots to actually, you know, f fire weapons. Um, there's been a case in the past in the US where a bomber was taken out by a, a again, these aren't autonomous robots yet, but these accountability systems we're talking about seem to be very tied to these issues. And so I think I took a short question, made it into a very long question. It was almost like a statement. But the question is really, are there times where we should be turning our thinking over and asking, when is autonomy or when is it worth trusting a black box, given the consequences of not doing so? I'm not 100% sure I'm getting the question right, but about trusting a black box or not, I, I will go back to the question of the difference in the interests of developers, deployers, and those decided about. Um, I think you, ha you have to think of the, mo the adversarial model that you're worried about for all of those groups. And you have to say, you know, the risks that I'm worried about um, can I can I defend against them in a black box scenario, understanding that the other players involved have different interests? If you can't, then I think you know that sometimes there's a as Alejandro was saying, there's reasons to go with explainable systems, even if there were a trade-off in some other properties, which often there isn't actually trade-offs. So that's a good thing to know. I need to get the best of both. But um you 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 might be willing to spend some accuracy to get more explainability if when you look at the threat models you're worried about you're like i just can't imagine the interests of all of the, the important stakeholders here being protected uh in a in a black box world well i guess yeah you know again again i guess it's just another um Another example of sort of the risk versus reward trade-offs, and I think that's one of the things the statement really talks about um, very much, is it, it makes it very clear that taking into account the impact versus the and effects was important, and that was discussed earlier on, so I'm going to skip some of the continuing questions on that. Um, There's some really good questions here. Uh, it, you know, one that one that I think I would address to G Gina and Ricardo because I think it it does tend to get blurred. The statement was very much about algorithmic systems per se, not just AI. And so, like one of the questions is, do we have to treat the ethics of robotic systems differently than disembodied AI? For example, the ethics of autonomous vehicles don't, on the face of it, necessarily seem uh, seem similar to the ethics of, say, a recommendation system or something like that. So, um, I would say right away, no. I mean, that we should use the the same set of principles. Maybe, maybe we can add more for some some uh, particular. Uh, products that may have some harms that, that are not covered by the nine principles. But I think the nine principles are, are uh, for any system at the end. So we on purpose, we, we talk about algorithmic system because if we only talk about the AI system, some people may say, okay, well, I don't use AI. So, so we have like a, a hole to, to basically don't follow the recommendation. So we, we explicitly wanted to cover and we say that explicitly any possible algorithmic system, but the truth is that uh, most of these principles are valid for any system that, that, that is uh, technology-based or that use software today. Today, I think it's very hard to find a machine that doesn't use software. So, so I think that that will cover, of course, robotics and will cover uh, almost any application today that, that 
that uses uh, IT technology. I strongly agree with that. And even a system that's based on an Excel spreadsheet or straight code, many of these same principles apply. There are special issues with AI that are worth discussing and understanding, but many of the principles we're talking about just apply to any algorithmic system. That's, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think I think just also like on, on that point, even on AI systems, I don't know if you've seen um, those diagrams that basically show in the deployment and productionization of AI, you have basically the machine learning model as like a little blip in the in the center and then you, you have all of the monitoring orchestration uh, audit logs scheduling so the actual system even around ai it will be an algorithmic system much more than it is the ai itself so i think it's 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 absolutely yeah correct uh, and, yeah, and a very good point and following what uh, Lorena said already, uh, we haven't thought about uh, the combination of all systems working together because everything is interconnected. So, so yeah. So, we, what happens when a system is switched off, or what happens when you put a new system, and so on? So, I think uh, really we we haven't thought about uh, also the system of systems. That's another system. You could imagine statements of principles that delve very specifically into a into a, an area like hiring systems or immigration systems or autonomous robots. All of those, you just like we take the ACM code of ethics and we translate it into, you know, principles for for algorithmic systems. You could get more specific and maybe give more guidance in any particular area. But I 100% agree with Ricardo and Alejandro that the fundamental principles don't change. So another question that uh, comes up in different guises is if you look at something like bioethics, which has had many, many more years of development than our fields, kind of more current focus on ethics, um, much of it becomes proactive rather than reactive. So for example, papers and, and recommendations and policy about, for example, human cloning have been being developed for decades now, even though that technology was not there yet, uh, rather than waiting for CRISPR to say, hey, we can do X, there was already a lot of thinking going on about what would happen when we reached such a point. Um, much of the accountability we're talking about, of course, must be post hoc. But what about as we move into some of this looking at, at, um, at, at, at sort of these issues sort of proactively? I mean, should we be you know, is is there a is there a way that that kind of um, thinking may came, come into things sort of helping to, def you know, much as ethicists long ago created the trolley problem. And now suddenly autonomous vehicle makers have to start worrying about making some of those very similar kinds of ethical decisions. So should we be taking some of these documents and using them less as sets of principles in more of a uh, prescriptive way. Um, maybe, maybe an initial thought uh, is that, I mean, absolutely, uh, you know, and, and I agree, uh, Jim, on, on those points. But what is perhaps interesting is that um, the reason why maybe this effort was extra challenging is because whilst some of the the, the points that, that you mentioned around uh, you know some of the bioethics, they are still uh, deeply embedded with with the let's call it use case. So in this case, it's like what are the ethics of, of cloning irrespective of technology? What are the ethics of uh, et cetera, et cetera? And I think this 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 initiative is 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 to try to uh, abstract what is the not not specifically. Uh, uh meta ethics but what what is the 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 ethics or the best practices from a horizontal level 
that we need to have as a foundation for the underlying technology to be from a at least uh, base level, um, minimizing potential undesirable outcomes, right? And even if all of this um, initial um, nine slash 18 principles are fulfilled, that is still um, uh, separate to the use case. So you may end up having a system that, uh, you know, is still kind of like fulfilling all of the all of the requirements of uh, legitimacy, competency, uh, minimizing harm, security, privacy, transparency, et cetera, et cetera. But it's still important to have a look at the use case and understand the context to make sure that it's actually addressed in a way that is still humane following following the the, the particular context of the of the of the field itself. So I think at the at the very base, what I the reason why I'm I'm so excited specifically for these principles is because they actually ta tackle it from a very sort of horizontal perspective at the system level best practice. Um, that then allow some of those other all the great work in other fields to be able to say, okay, well now we can match the foundation with the, with the outcome. Um, now, of course, I still agree with your point. I do think that as computer scientists, it is now uh, the fun part to like what uh, Jenna mentioned uh, to actually perform even like deeper analysis that are on verticals, right? It's like, okay, well, how does this affect on recruitment systems? How does this affect on uh, hiring systems, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so yeah, basically um, agreeing on, 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 on those points. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. and following Alejandro, I think good that you mentioned bioethics and, and I will dare to speak a little bit about something that's not my field, but I had good teachers. So the, fir the first thing I, I will say that the importance of context that Lorena mentioned first, and then Alejandro is uh, reinforcing, uh, we need to recognize also the limitations uh, of the of our technologies and this part of the context. For example, data is just the proxy of whatever we are solving. So data doesn't capture the context, doesn't capture the whole problem. Usually, all the models that that we are using, not only in in, in AI but also in statistics, in physics, and and so on, are simplifications of the world. So we are we are just uh, having proxies for all this, and. And regarding bioethics, the, the three fundamental values of development report are basically uh, the respect of autonomy, uh, basically the uh, people autonomy. Uh, then you have justice, which is uh, related to fairness, but it's uh, very hard and it's a human thing. And, and I, I, I see in the chat still people talk about ethical AI or crosswords AI that is trying to humanize things that you shouldn't humanize. And the last one is that basically do do good and and, and not do bad. So basically, uh, what is in number the principle number two? But these these values uh, are the basic ones, and these principles are not the real values. These are these are instrumental principles, and and uh, that's also very explicit on on the statement that these are just ways to achieve these uh, three main values that maybe we can adopt from bioethics, or maybe we can. Uh, take, for example, human rights, but all these nine or 18 principles, that's a, I never noticed that all of them are, 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 are pairs, uh, are to achieve those values. So basically uh, by themselves that are not that much there, they have to be using combinations and also what Alejandro said, even if we fulfill those nine or 18 values, sorry, these principles, we still need to work on, on how they interact to each other and how they help each other and how they conflict with each other. So there's, if there's no conflict, there's no ethics. Yeah, um, an interesting question just pops up. So I think someone ref um, is, you know, responding to some of what we've, um, what you've just said about, you know, some of the verticals, but, you know, gives a good example that in terms of hiring system, Google receives about 3 million applications a year. And so some AI, um, sorry, the questions keep moving back and forth, making it hard sometimes for me to tell, uh, is basically saying, you know, there must be some AI um, uh, 
Okay, I have no idea where the question. Is. I think I'm moved to to answered. Uh, if you can oh, be answered okay. at the bottom. Yes, yes, question. yes. So um, the increase in online applications overwhelms many companies. So really, the question, you know, looking at the kind of principles we've development, we've we've been discussing, you know, what kind of processes might developers and managers use to actually in, ensure a fair and just decision? in this sort of accountability and responsibility where we can't, you know, where we do have to turn some of this over to AI simply because of volume. And, um, no, let's leave it at that. I'm just going to add in some other stuff. Let's just stop with that question explicitly. I, th I think this is a really good example of where the interests of deciders are very different than those being decided about. Um, you could imagine a, a, a system that Google would say, you know, I think we're, we're finding fine people to hire here. This system is working well, perfectly happy. But you, you could also imagine that there might be errors that are happening to some people that, that systematically disadvantage them. And from their perspective, that might not be okay. And also like there's in many countries, there's uh, you have legal rights in the hiring in the hiring process. What can and cannot be considered. And um, I, I I recently saw you know there had been this Amazon internal system which they discarded that had been downgrading women's resumes. Um, and I I I think I read that they recently came up with a new system and I they're or they're about to and they're like firing recruitment professionals or whatever, because they feel that this new system is good. I don't know too much about the new system, but, um, you know, if you look at that, that system holistically, right. Um, Google is choosing to receive email or, uh, uh, applications in that way. You could debate the pros and cons of other ways of allowing people to enter that system and the equity and justice issues and whatever kind of entrance to the system there are then there would be a choice to hire more people to do more of those roles or to have more supervision. For what it's worth, I think a good, a better way to deploy humans in systems is to very robustly investigate um, expressions of concern. So access, redress, so that if, if 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 people feel that they are 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 not being served well by this system, that there are humans who who are tasked with investigating and given incentives when they find problems, not when they don't find problems, and that there's enough metadata and provenance and documentation kept throughout the life cycle of the system and the usage of the system that those humans have something to work with to really investigate why are why are these people being systematically um, uh, uh, disadvantaged in this particular process, or we hear reports of that. We want to investigate that to find out if that's accurate. And if you do not have incentives that that's, if the incentives simply stop with Google saying, oh, this, this hiring system seems to be working well enough for us, it will not protect the legal rights in the hiring process of those being decided about if there's errors, because even uh, you know, errors, even low level errors that matter to certain groups of people are, you know, uh, we need to incentivize that kind of debugging of these systems and not just stop when the developers and the deciders are happy. Let me complement that uh, because it's, 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 I think high system is uh, one of the non-ethical uses of AI. So so just to, to, to do the question that I will ask using the legitimacy and competence uh, uh, principle will be, for example, first, uh, does the system use uh, any uh, hypothesis that is not scientifically proven? For example, uh, if you have read the interesting work of uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett last year about emotion detections that humans cannot do, and we're training systems uh, with those labels, uh, so of course, then AI cannot do that. So the motion detection in videos or images doesn't really work all the time. So that would be one thing that that you could could use. But people is using even games also for for testing skills of people, uh, and you can say, okay, for this given 
uh, work, any proof that, for example, if you're good at this game, you are the best uh, qualified person for that? That would be one, another question. Uh, and, and one more larger question, which is uh, basically another limitation or basically or an ethical issue or of any system that decides about one single person is, uh, are really humans part of a distribution of people and we can use data from other people to decide our, of our fate? Uh, I don't think that's, that's the case either. So we, we have many questions that, that, that are basic, that, that are not even thought by these uh, the developers and designers of these systems. Okay, uh, I'm sure we'd love to go on at great length. And but I think Lorena, I'm sure, has to say something. I, really I, I know, but I'm actually about to call on Lorena in a second. What I was actually going to do is say, what I'd like to do is give everybody a chance to sort of give a summary statement, uh, finalizing things, taking a couple minutes to really add anything that you feel hasn't come up or that you feel is important. And I was actually going to go in the reverse order we presented. So I was going to ask Lorena to go first. and. Oh, I actually wanted to jump into the conversation um, because I think that while we're um, what we're discussing, actually, um, it sort of reveals um, we're discussing questions of power. Suddenly, engineers have to be fair and have to decide what is fair and have to decide about things they have never been trained for because they are not lawyers or they are not. Um, many of them will not be. Uh, the main experts in the field where they are programming something, uh, but they are part of a team where they might have other type of experts that cope for that. And suddenly engineers are having, um, with the way how they engineer, a, a moment of normative um, power. It's the norm that you're giving how processes are going to go through and be automated through. And I think that um, that um, it, a lot of the questions that have been asked, how can we do this ethically? My, my, my answer would be, you don't have to. It's not your job. You have not been trained for that. It's not you that have to uh, have two different careers um, to do that. But I think that what it shows is actually that creating systems is an interdisciplinary effort. And you cannot do this as a discipline on your own. And you cannot do this only as a pure academical effort, but you need to do this also with legal people, but you will also need to do this. And this is also crucial, and we haven't talked about this. We will have to do it with the people that are going to be subjected to the system, which are the ones at the receiving end. Um, that mine, and those are usually people that might not be able to define what an algorithm is, or will not understand the system, Na the, the names of the algorithms or statistics at all, um, but they are very well at describing what doesn't work. And um, they are well also at finding ways how to change uh, and to trick the system for their own senses. And they are very good at um, hiding their own prejudices behind the system and um, and those are things that I think we, we need to understand when we create this type of systems. You are only part of, and you can only be part of a team as an engineer. And um, what worries me most is when engineers think that they have to do all the way, all the rest of the way when creating all these type of systems. And um, I see it, I, I think that if, if you think, I agree that we need, that that engineers need to study ethics when they start. Then they also we need to study history to understand that better uh, how specific statistic methods and mathematical effort uh, methods were created because they have a past and the reasons how they were created and developed um, do also. Um, I have a lot to say how they are being used now, for instance, the question of biometrics has a lot to do also with how biometrics was initially conceived of, conceived for. Um, Lorraine, I'm gonna, we, we're losing you and, and I'm going to impose, um, we really have only a couple minutes left and I'd like to give everybody, so, so the two minute 
con final statements you were asked to give are now one minute final statements and uh, Alejandro, uh, you would be next. Um, yeah, so I think um, uh, my um, yeah, kind of like closing closing words would be to basically emphasize what has already been mentioned. Um, this uh, joint statement is only the start, and this is of, uh, uh, more of a call to action for people in the webinar to really take this statement, read it through, and find ways to action it, whether it's writing further around verticals or even even get involved in some of the great open working groups. Uh, but we're going to be very excited to contribute on other, um, you know, follow-up work from this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ricardo? Yes, uh, I, I think I will, I will reinforce uh, what I, I mentioned at the beginning. I think that, that the main question that usually we don't ask as computer scientists is uh, these legitimacy and competence questions. I mean, all if you take all the examples, for example, incident database of AI, which is a great place to find uh, issues, uh, most of these questions were never asked, and one of them was never, not asked, and then we ran into problems. So basically, think about uh, or what Gina said. So include, include. Uh, all the people that will be involved in the system, particularly users, uh, check your assumptions just before you start with the design. Uh, check if, if, for example, what they feel about what you want to do with the system, because maybe what they feel is different, what they perceive is completely different from what you perceive. Even the system could be fair for a mathematical uh, standard, but maybe it's not fair for other reasons for some people. So you need to check all that and you need to be more empathic with the rest of the world. Thank you. And Gina, you got to open, so I'll, I'll let you close. Wow, uh, so many things. I think I will um, say that as technologists, I want us to move past the, this is gonna be great for everyone version of technology, because it's not gonna be great for everyone. There are real trade-offs. There are real winners and losers in these conversations. And we owe it to all the stakeholders to help them understand what is at stake and help them advocate for the definition of fairness and equity that they want to. You know, there's individual fairness and group fairness. You know, are you going to be fair to all humans? You're going to be fairer to some humans than others. You're going to be fair to all living creatures on the earth. None of those have are are you know all of those things are good. Individual rights, group rights, good to all humans, good to all living things. There are trade offs. And when we build systems, as Lorraine is saying, we shouldn't pretend that as technologists, we know the answers to these things. We should be listening to the people who know in the application domains, listening to ethicists, um, and not telling everyone this is going to be good for everyone. Trust us. Instead, we should be providing evidence of the operation of the system rather than saying blind trust. Thank you. So I'm going to thank all the panelists. Adam, uh, if you would put up that slide we had from before where uh, you had how to get involved with the policy work, um, you could put that up while I am saying to the panelists, you know, you, you can see in the chat how many people have been saying what a great panel it was. Uh, I'm sure my students will appreciate um what what they've seen and learned today i think this has been really an excellent panel and i just want to thank all of you and you know i know in this in this mode i can only you know sort of symbolically clap my hands for the many participants and many people who've sent questions and answers and again to join the um policy committees Here's the information. There are some other activities we're doing. We also are looking at expanding to more of the world than just Europe and US and keep your eye out for information about that. And in any case, getting involved, uh, easiest way to start is by sending email to the ACMPO at ACM.org. And again, thank you all. Thank so many of you for coming and listening to us today and those of you who watch this later on and uh uh
video and won't be able to ask your questions, please feel free to reach out to ACM or I expect most of the panelists will be happy to take your uh, questions if you say that you saw them here. And so with that, let me end this. And again, just thank everybody.